The two things in my life that I have cared the most about are not cars, or not places I got to go, or things mm -hmm. I got to do. They're this watch and this flight jacket. That's why I still have them both. Wow. I love these things. Hi everyone, I'm Brandon Frazen, Director of Vintage at Bob's Watches, and I'm uh, on location here at the USS Midway in San Diego. We're on board an HS3 helicopter. H3. H3, excuse me. H3 helicopter. And I'm here with our good friend, Tom Finley. Um, we actually have an upcoming auction where we're featuring his watch, his jacket he's wearing, and a bunch of other memorabilia that Tom has saved and collected over the years in his Navy career. Some of it's NASA related, and um, it's a pretty special story, and we are here with Tom for him to tell it to us. So uh, please, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Certainly, thank you, Brandon, and welcome aboard. I'm Tom Finley. I was in the Navy for 28 years. Mm -hmm. I was a pilot, uh, specifically a helicopter pilot of this type of helicopter. Uh, I've got a 4,500 hours flying in this type. When I graduated from uh, university in 1966, my two choices were to join the service or be drafted. Right, for Vietnam. So I ran out and joined the Navy, mm -hmm. and it was the best decision I've ever made. I enjoyed every single minute of it. I was on active duty for 28 years mm -hmm. in the Navy, and I've been a docent here on the Midway for the last 17 years. Wow. Yeah. Time has flown by. So. I know you said you joined in 66, yeah. and you were first on which was which aircraft carrier were you stationed uh, It was on? called a Kearsarge. Right, and that's and what's that's right here. Right? right on here. And the Kearsarge was an old World War II carrier mm -hmm. that we used for search and rescue platform off the coast of Vietnam. And that's what I did. I was a search and rescue helicopter okay, pilot. Yeah. The only watch I had when I got to that ship was my grandfather's gold watch that mm -hmm. they gave him when he retired, which I promptly hit against something metal and <laughs> smashed. Wow. And yeah. then the Navy gave us uh, pilots' watches mm -hmm. that they wanted us to wear. Mine was a Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Like a field watch? A field watch. It was exactly what it's yep. like. And uh, what happened, though, the temperature was over 100 degrees every day when it would be flying, and the humidity was also that high. So somehow water got in that, moisture mm. got in it, probably from my own wrist. Yeah. And it ruined that, too. Yep. So then as we were heading into Hong Kong, I had no watch. Yep. So, so that's a problem. So I needed one. <laughs> Uh, I talked to the other guys on the ship uh, who had been in similar circumstances. They said, what you need is a Rolex watch because they're really hard to break. Yeah. So when we got into Hong Kong, we went to the Artland Watch Company, mm -hmm. which was where most of the Navy guys went. And I found a watch that I liked and bought it. And Other guys got theirs too. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But, uh, yeah. So you picked the GMT. Yeah. What just? What drew you to it? Because you said you didn't really know much about Basically, watches before, right? Basically, because it looked red, white, and blue. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that was the reason <laughs> That's I got. awesome. And I, I just liked the look of it. Okay. And uh, it was different at that time. Most people's watches, like my grandfather's, was just a dress watch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the Navy one was just very basic. Mm -hmm. And this one was a combination of both. It was not basic, but it wasn't really flashy and shiny like right. a dress watch either. Yeah. And so I got it, and for the next 54 years, <laughs> I loved it. What was your involvement with the Apollo 14 mission? Okay, uh... Two, one, zero. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. The tower is clear. About four or five months before the mission mm -hmm. happened, our squadron was identified to take part in it, specifically to recover the astronauts mm -hmm. once they landed in the water. Mm -hmm. And then we divided up into crews with very specific jobs to do. Yep. There was an aircraft that would pick up the astronauts, and that was the one I was in. Uh -huh. There was one that would put in the life rafts, and then 
the UDT SEAL team guys mm -hmm. to do that. There was a photo airplane. Mm -hmm. There was a communications relay helicopter up there. Everybody had very specific things to do. And we practiced that with the NASA people and a, uh, a mock-up of the capsule here in San Diego and also in Hawaii before we headed down to where the, uh, the astronauts were supposed in. to land, which was about 900 miles south of American Samoa. So we practiced intensely because that's how NASA did things. Mm -hmm. They wanted things to be done right the first time. Right. You don't get a second chance on something like that. Not this important. So that day when you actually, like, the, you got the call, they landed it, they, you know, they landed in the water. Um, do you remember? Can you take oh, us yeah, through that? Oh, yeah, definitely. We knew exactly what time it was supposed to come and through the And this was February 9th, 1971? Correct. Okay. And you, yeah, and you actually gave us the flight log paper, and we have the flight log with everything detailed that you were there. Yes. And... Well, they put us in the air about uh, 45 minutes before the capsule was to come down, and we were all pre-positioned mm -hmm. where we were supposed to be. And then... Uh, you could actually even in the helicopter hear the sonic booms when it came through the overhead. Wow. You could see the parachutes open. We had a helicopter circling around it all the way down with these big orange and white parachutes, three of them. We saw it hit the water and then all the things that had to set happen started set in motion. Once they were ready we were signaled to come in and pick up each one of the astronauts individually. The whole time we were recovering those astronauts, when I wasn't looking at the instruments and monitoring everything, <laughs> as we were moving in, I took this sequence of pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can see oh. us with the, uh, the oxygen yep. mask that, on. That's and you, all right? Or is that that's me. That's, no, you, that's yeah. me. Yeah. But in the pictures, you can actually see the space capsule yeah, I think in, in the water. You can for sure in some of them. Yeah, I think in some uh, of the later ones in here. And then the Kitty Hawk was the capsule that orbited the moon mm -hmm. numerous times while the Lunar Explorer module went down to the moon, let the guys out, and then they brought them back up, but it stayed up there in space. Uh -huh. The Kitty Hawk got Came to come back. back and land in the water. Right, that was called the Kitty Hawk. And yeah. this little piece of it says, this is to certify that the attached material was part of the outer skin of the Apollo 14 spacecraft that carried astronauts Shepard, Mitchell, and Rusa on their historic flight to the moon 31 January, 9 February, 1971. And it's signed by Terry Slezak, Mission Specialist, Lunar Receiving Lab, mm -hmm. Decontamination Team. Wow. I was really impressed with that. So you gave us this and a few other patches that you took off over the years to make room. So, yeah. so this is a HS6 patch, and this is the squadron you were in. That's right? correct, yeah. And then this helicopter is actually also part of that, was part of that squadron at one point, right? Could you just explain this patch a little bit? Sure. Please. Uh, every aviation unit in the Navy and even the Air Force, they all have their own squadron patches. Mm -hmm. And this was ours, and it is a submarine. We were, our job was to find and attack submarines. Primary job, but secondary job was search and rescue. Mm -hmm. And during the Vietnam War, there were no submarines in the in the uh, Tonkin Gulf, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of requirements to rescue people Got who were it. shot down or just crashed. Then ultimately, I did so many things over the years. I had all these different ships that I was assigned to, yep. and almost all of them are represented by the patches that are mm -hmm. on here. The two things in my life that I've cared the most about are not cars, or not places I got to go, or things mm -hmm. I got to do. They're this watch and this flight jacket. Those are the, that's why I still have them both. Wow. I loved these things, I really do. That's and amazing. I, and I still do. And when I look at the watch and think, that's really neat, it's seen a lot, <laughs> seen me grow old, <laughs> and it's been a lot of places and done a lot of things. And the flight jacket speaks for itself because it's like a travel log. Absolutely. You look at all the patches on it. What happened was this. I thought over all these years that one of my sons would want this watch mm -hmm. and would want this jacket, but it didn't turn out that way, like it does with a lot of other things when your kids grow up. Yeah. They move on and, and they're in a different place now, and so they didn't want any of it. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking to myself, 
why not try to figure out a way where somebody who might be interested in aviation, might be interested in the space program, mm -hmm. might be interested in the combination of all this, might be interested in the Vietnam War, all those things would want this. Totally, yeah, well said. Um, and any words to the person who's, for, you know, the lucky winner of this uh, auction? I just hope you enjoy it. For all you out there interested in checking out the sale, be sure to check out bobswatches.com for the upcoming auction for this amazing watch, jacket, and all these other amazing goodies that Tom has saved over the years.